The Doctrine of Eyes, Part 5. And there is a Part 6, which we'll do next week. But this week we're doing Part 5. We try to base this work on self-evaluation rather than on work evaluation in the beginning. When people begin to do this work, the first thing they do is they begin to evaluate the work, not as the work is, but at how they are. Can I do this? Is this something that I want to do? Is this going to interfere with my life? Is this going to make me look better? Is this going to make me feel better? What's in it for me? Now that's a good thing. What's in it for me is a good thing. But when we base the work on self-evaluation, whether I can do this work or not, whether I can get anything out of this work or not, that begins to go too far. What happens is we try to add the work to what we already are. We don't look at it like this work is going to radically change me. We look at it like, well, this will be a little decorating. I'll have a throw pillow here and a little curtain there and oh, and a nice little throw rug over here. And, oh, you know, I always wanted a vase just like that Japanese vase, the sprigs of pussy willows and the little plum blossom branches in there. That's what I'd like. And so we add these things like we're decorating ourselves. We're fixing ourselves just the little areas. You know, there's, there's not much that needs to be fixed about us. We don't need radical surgery. We don't need open heart surgery or anything. We just need this wart removed and our teeth straightened and our hair curled and maybe colored a little bit. And well, you know, the contacts would be good. See, so, so little things, just little things that we need. This work is good for other people because we can see that they really need some changes. The guy I work with, man, that guy, he really needs this work. It's been good for me because look at how much better I am now. But he really needs this work. He needs a complete overhaul. But me, I just need a little facelift here and there. We try to add the work to what we already are. The work can only start from what is genuine, though. This is the problem. The work can only start from what is genuine. And there's nothing genuine about that. There's nothing genuine about fixing a little mole here and removing a wart there. There's nothing genuine about that. That's all self-interest. It's all about one thing and one thing only. It's all about the false personality. How good do I look? We don't care if we're different inside, as long as other people think we're better. That's what's important in the beginning. After a while, it's not like that anymore. After a while, when you begin to practice self-observation properly, you begin to see what you really are. When you begin to see what you really are, then you have a major valuation for the work because you realize that this work can help you to get out of that. Because you're not going to change that. You're not going to change what you really are. That's the way that is. The question is, are you going to be able to make that passive and make something else what you really are? Not what you really are, but what you really are. Are you going to make something else active and make what you really are in this life passive? What this world has made you, what you call yourself. Are you going to be able to make that passive and make something else that you don't know what that is right now active? So the work can only start from what is genuine. Even in false personality, which starts the work, we must find more genuine eyes. Now, the truth is, in false personality, they're all a bunch of liars. All the eyes are a bunch of liars. None of them can really be trusted. But there are eyes that lie less than other eyes. There are eyes that... <laughs> Connie was telling me a story the other day about our neighbor's little girl. Her mother said, oh, she's a... What did she say? A compulsive liar. She lies about everything. Whether she needs to lie or not, she said she had three dogs and three cats, and she said, we do have three dogs. Well, what about the cats? We've never had a cat. She just lies because she can. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm not willing to make a judgment about the child because I don't know the child. I don't know the situation. Maybe it's imagination. Maybe it's lying. Maybe it's for attention. Maybe she'd like three cats. Maybe she's having a difficult time mentally and can't tell the difference between reality. I don't know. I don't know what the problem is, but I'm not going to jump to a conclusion. But we have eyes in us that are more genuine than other eyes. We have eyes in us that are more capable of telling the truth than other eyes. We have eyes in us that are better eyes than other eyes, even in false personality. What we need to do is learn how to get ourselves under the influence of better eyes, bigger eyes, higher eyes, eyes that are more internal. And the more internal eyes are closer to your essential self. And those eyes are better eyes because they can lift you up. They can bring you closer towards your essential self. And that's what you want. In order to do that, though, you've got to let go of this false personality, this group of eyes, this thousands of eyes in false personality that promise you the world and deliver nothing. But they promise you everything. They promise you fame. They promise you fortune. They promise you, they promise you everything. And they deliver nothing. So the work is this radical thing that seeks to alter us radically. 
within ourselves. It's not going to alter your appearance necessarily, but it's going to alter you inside where the real alteration is needed, where life is really lived. Life is really lived from the inside out, not from the outside in. And we've got it all backwards. We've got it all confused. Instead of be, do, have, we've got have, do, be. Instead of be a ballerina, do the things that ballerinas do, and then you'll have the things that ballerinas have. We do it just the opposite. We go out and buy the tutu and the toe shoes, buy the little parallel bars, and we buy the mirrors, and then we start to do the things that ballerinas do. We put on the tutu, we put on the toe shoes, and we stand on the parallel bar, and we pose in front of the mirrors. And that's it. And then we expect to be a ballerina by doing that. But that's not how it works. The way it works is you start to be a ballerina inside. Then you will end up doing things that ballerinas do, and then you'll end up having what ballerinas have. That's how life actually works. When we work it the other way around, it's always a mess. And if you look at life, you'll see that there are a billion rock stars in life. We were next to one coming back from yoga the other day. A woman about my age, and she's in a van. And the music is like, boom, boom, boom. So all the windows are up. Boom, boom, boom. I thought, man, these teenagers. And I look over, and it's a woman my age. And she is rocking, man. I mean, she is rocking out in there, singing at the top of her lungs, you know, to this boom, boom song. And I went, whoa. Dude, reality check. I wanted to knock on her window. Reality check. So that's what life is like, is people are imagining that there's something that they're not. They want to be something, so they go and they get the things that those people have, and then they start doing the things. So they play air guitar, and they sing into microphones that they don't have, or beer cans, or whatever. And they pretend to be something that they're not, because they'd like to be that. And what is it they want to be? They want to be famous. We'll talk about that a little bit later, perhaps. The work is hated by most of the eyes inside of us. And if you don't know that yet, you need to get busy because you have not been observing what's actually going on inside of you. Because what's actually going on inside of you is the eyes inside of us hate this work, most of them. They don't want to do this at all. They don't like this at all because it means their demise. It means that they're going to be made passive. They're going to lose their position. You remember what the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin said about Jesus? They said, if he keeps this up, we're going to lose our position. And they loved their position. They liked praying in the street corner so that other people could see them and see how devout and holy and righteous they were. They liked the chief seats at the dinners. They liked to be invited and they get the best seat, the best food, and they liked that. They liked to wear the long flowing garments so that people knew that they were righteous and they knew that they were devout men. They knew that they were very spiritual people. And his thing was, look, that's your reward. That's what you get for that. Then that's it. That's your reward. You get nothing else. You just get the praise of people, the praise of men, which today is and tomorrow is like the grass falls into the fireplace. It's worthless. The praise of men is worthless. But we don't believe that. We've got eyes inside of us. Oh, no, the praise of men, that's everything. It's a Nobel Peace Prize. What about this? And what about that? And what about the Pulitzer Prize? And what about this foundation? And what about that? Well, what about all that? Well, that'll give me what I want. Mm-hmm. So you can see those eyes are lost in that tangle of insanity there. The work doesn't ask you to give up life, but it does ask you to change your relationship to life. Specifically, it asks you to change your relationship to your life personality. So we have two personalities. This life personality that was built by life. And we have another personality. The essential part of us is really a personality. So I guess we could call it essence personality, but instead we'll just call it essence the essential part of us. But the work asks you to change your life personality, your relationship to your life personality, your relationship to yourself in life, and your relationship to others in life. That's what the work asks you to do, and how you act, how you see yourself in life. This is a lot to ask, and this is why so many eyes hate the work. This is why so much of us, so much inside of us resist this. So many eyes just resist this. They can find so many other things to do and think about. Have you noticed that? Let's observe this. Let's not and say we did. They're good at that. When we notice through self-observation eyes whose motives we begin to dislike, we begin to understand what this work is about. The real danger for us is justifying the motives of the eyes that we see in ourselves. That's the real danger, always the real danger, justifying them, making excuses for them, keeping them around because, well, they're cute little fellas, or because they did us a favor or whatever. That's the real danger in this work. But when we can start to see these eyes, begin to dislike their motives, real self-observation 
will show you the motive of the eyes you're observing. And when you start to see the motives of the eyes that you're observing, if you have anything inside of you that's genuine and sincere, anything at all, it will be repelled by their motives because their motives are false. And if you have anything genuine, it's repelled by falsity because it's a lie and it only wants sincere, genuine company. Our karma. We don't talk about karma very often. The work doesn't talk about karma very often. Our karma is the tangle of cause and effect that we lay down in ourselves by our actions. Karma exists in you, not something out there. Yes, there's a law of karma, but karma exists inside of you. It's wrapped up and coiled up and bundled up inside of you, and you carry it wherever you go. And it is this tangle, it's like this fishing line that got snarled in this knot. And that's tangled up inside of you, and you can't get away from it because it's in you. You carry it with you. But our karma begins to change in this work. The work says that we're under the laws of accident, the law of fate, and or the law of will. We're not under all those laws. And in a sense, we're under all those laws to varying degrees. It's really like a pyramid, with the law of accident being the base of the pyramid. We are mostly under that. And then the apex of the pyramid, that would be the law of will. Somewhere down there is, not very far down, is the law of fate. So let's look at this and see if we can understand the laws of accident, fate, and will. We're also under the law of karma. The law of karma falls somewhere between accident and fate. If we do what we do consciously, just this one thing, you don't have to change what you're doing. Just start to do what you do consciously. If you'll do that, you already begin to change your karma. Why would that be? Well, because you've already put yourself under a different influence. You've put yourself under a more conscious influence. You've put yourself under the influence of a better law or better laws. Okay, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it like bumper cars. You ever been to an amusement park where they had bumper cars? And you just get in the bumper cars and you push your foot down on the pedal. You go scooting around, bam, 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 bumping into everything. Bumper cars. That's like the law of accident. That doesn't prepare you much for the freeway. At least hopefully it doesn't. Although I have to admit that I have seen people who drive that look like they just get off the bumper car ride. I've seen people who didn't pay much attention to the lines in the road or the signals and the signs and the stop signs and the red lights and the green lights and the yellow lights or whatever they think. Yellow light means hurry up and get through before it turns red. Stomp it. It doesn't mean caution, slow down or stop. It means hurry up. I got some eyes that have some issues there, I see. <laughs> I get to them sometimes in the not too distant future. Actually, see now what is it? I'm seeing, I'm seeing. You ever catch yourself talking and you realize what a load of crap it is? Well that's what just happened to me. <laughs> I just caught myself talking. What a load of junk that is. And that's a good thing, because now you do what you do more consciously. It didn't change what I did. I was still talking about some old associations about people and the way they drive. But I looked at it consciously. And can you see how that's going to change my karma? You can see how that's going to change things because I'm never going to be as unconscious as I was before I looked at it about that thing. I'll never be quite as unconscious. Oh, I'll drop back into unconsciousness. But you know what? That awareness, this awareness right now, is going to act like a life preserver in a sense. It'll just bob me back up to the top. It'll just bring me up a little bit higher. And that's the way these things work. And that's the beauty of this work. It's just these little realizations. If you can be sincere. So it's like, I'm not saying you have to admit to the whole world like I just did. Oh, look at that. I'm an idiot. Which is fine. I mean, look at that. I am an idiot. But I don't care. Why don't I care? Because everybody listening is an idiot. In fact, everybody we know is an idiot. But an idiot's not a bad thing. It's just you need to find out what kind of an idiot you are. Identify what kind of an idiot you are, rather than be identified with the kind of idiot that you are. And there is a difference. So if we do what we do consciously, we change our karma. We then begin to pass under the law of fate, which is really deeper cause and effect. It's deeper because it's closer to essence. False personality is under the law of accident. It's out there in the bumper car realm. There are all these different eyes, and they're just out there, bam, 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 just doing whatever they do. We begin to pass under the law of fate, which is deeper cause and effect. By changing essence, we may change fate and come under the law of will. See, this whole work, people think, oh, your essential self, that, that's what you want to be. Well, yes, that's where you want to move to from here. But you remember that your essence came here to grow. What does that mean? Well, it came here to change. It came here to get something it couldn't get anywhere else. That's why it's here. So finding your essence and getting to your essence is just the beginning of the journey. It's not, oh, I made it, now it's over. No, you haven't reached real eye. 
You've just reached your essence, your essential self. You've just made false personality passive enough so that you can start to see who you really are, how you came into this life, before all this stuff was added to you by life itself. We're just trying to get rid of the masks at this point. Once we get rid of the masks, then we can see what we've actually got to work with. Until then, we've got a lot of masks and makeup and overcoats to get rid of first. It seems like a lot of work. And if it seems discouraging to you, it's only because you don't realize the power of the work. That's why. Because you realize you can't do, but you don't realize the power of the work. And the power of the work is mighty. It really is. It can do what you cannot do. The light cures you. All you have to do is let the light in. All you have to do is open the windows. All you have to do is open the blinds. All you have to do is open the shutters. Let the light in. Let the light in. Fearlessly, consistently, persistently, let the light in. And the light will cure you. The light will heal you. Fate is determined by the quality of essence. If we want to have a different life, we have to change stored essence. Stored essence is a new term. I haven't talked to you about this. And I haven't talked to you about this because it's a problem, because it has to deal with recurrences. The idea behind stored essence is that stored up from past recurrences, you have something coiled up in essence, and that attracts your life the kind of life that you have, the kind of parents that you have, the kind of situation that you are born into. Money, no money, this country, that country, this color skin, that color skin, recurrences stored up, wound up, and you have that ball of something in your essence that attracts situations in life that it needs to grow. In order to have a different life, we've got to change stored essence. And as you can tell, this is not an easy task because we haven't been able to do much with false personality let alone even get to essence to deal with it. What we really are will always attract the same experiences to us over and over again. Notice why some people always end up in abusive relationships. Have you ever wondered why? It's because they have something wound up inside of them that they need to learn, and they're not learning it. Instead of finding out what is in them that they need to learn, they're pointing out there to the abuser, he's doing it to me. And they never find what it is inside themselves that is getting them into that situation. So what we really are will always attract the same experience as the object of the work is to change essence. Essence is where real will lies. The door to real will is essence. It's not false personality. False personality will give you nothing. It's all false. It's the wrong direction. It's something that's pointed outward toward life. You need to be pointed inward toward your real I, toward real will, toward what's the most essential real part of you. Your work is there. Your work can't really happen there until you can stop the distractions from false personality constantly dragging you away, taking all of your force, involving you in all these things out here that you don't want to or need to be involved in. If you don't have any power of self-observation, if you have not practiced non-identifying self-observation, real, genuine self-observation, if you have not fearlessly gone and observed your false personality and all those many hundreds and thousands of eyes like they were interesting strangers, then you're not going to be able to see through the eyes. And if you can't see through the eyes, you're going to take them for what they appear to be. You're not going to see their motivation. You don't see their motivation. You're not going to learn to dislike them, pull away from them. You're not going to learn to choose something better. It's like when you were a kid and you had friends and your parents said, you know, it's not your best choice of friends. <laughs> you really fought that. You're not going to tell me who my friends are and blah, blah, And it turned out that friend was a real jerk and wasn't really a friend at all. Your parents were right. Now somebody, of course, will say, oh, I had a friend and my parents were wrong. There's always going to be some contrary eyes that want to spoil the work. And they will. They'll spoil the work. But they spoil it for themselves. They don't spoil it for anyone else. And so that's why I say some people can't do this work, because they have no valuation of it. They're not willing to let the contrary eyes take a back seat so that the work can do what it has to do. They want to fight with the work. And fine, if you want to fight with the work, go ahead. That'll be your work, and that's it. You won't get much out of it, except the satisfaction of knowing that you're right, you fought, you're better, you're superior, blah, 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 blah. But if you want to change, the things you have to do, suck it up and do it. So if you don't have any power of self-observation, you can't see through the eyes, you take yourself for granted. And if you take yourself for granted, you won't change essence. What do I mean by take yourself for granted? What I mean is you take yourself and your life for granted. Well, this is my life. This is myself. This is what I got. Take it all for granted. Well, this is the way it is. It's, it's good. It's okay. It's all good. That's taking yourself for granted. If you do that, you're not going to change essence. Going with eyes in false personality leads to a hopeless tangle of inner accounts. See, we think there are salvageable eyes in false personality. We believe that false personalities are savior. 
We believe that there are things in false personality that we absolutely must have in order to survive this life. We did have to have those things in the past because those were the things that protected essence when we were very small. But now we need to be making false personality passive. We no longer need it. And false personality doesn't like that. It's gotten used to royalty. It's gotten used to running everything. And it runs things through fear now. And so now you're afraid to get rid of certain things in false personality because false personality threatens that you'll die, that you'll lose everything. It'll come up with all kinds of scenarios to make you feel unsafe, to make you restless, to make you not at peace to make you worried, harried, all of the things that, that you don't need to be. So going with eyes and false personality leads to a hopeless tangle of inner accounts. What that means is we end up with a hopeless tangle of inner accounts. Well, that person owes me this. Well, that person, I don't like those kind of people. Well, Japanese people or black people or Mexican people or white people or men or kids or people over 30 or old people or those blue hairs that are driving or those people are, it's a, just this endless tangle of accounts. And it's insane. There's no way to unravel it. If you get in there and try and play lawyer to find the truth in a room full of liars, you've wasted your life. You're wasting your time. You're never going to find the truth in a room full of liars until you find the truth that I'm in a room full of liars. Best thing to do is get out of here, not be one of them. That's the best thing to do. But no, we think there are liars who are savable. And that's the hook every time. Let me just help you. Here, let me, let me help you. you. I know you don't really want to. Come on, you don't really want to lie. Come on into the light. Well, just a minute, I'll come into the light. Well, it takes a little time to come into the light, so you help me by coming here into the darkness a little bit more. And the next thing you know, you're lost. It doesn't work that way. You can't go with those eyes. They don't mean you any good. They'll tell you anything because they're liars. But they're full of self-interest, and their self-interest is all in false personality, and false personality is not you. We have praise, praise and blame. The opposite of praise is blame. Or we have fame. What's the opposite of fame? Obscurity. Praise, blame, fame, obscurity. Let's just take that little group there, those two things and their opposites, because that's plenty to work with. Well, what is most real, what is most genuine in you, your essence, grow through the desire for praise? Is there any question about this? I mean, think about this. Is there really any question? What is most real and most genuine? Will that grow through a desire for praise? No. We all agree. No, it will not. But observe for a moment how much of your ordinary happiness depends on being praised. Ouch! If you get a peek at that, it's like, ow! Ow, it runs me! It's why I live and move and have my being, so that other people can acknowledge me and praise me can accept me and tell me that I'm not as bad as those all those people in my past told me I was. It's a huge hook. It's a meat hook. It's not a fish hook. It's a meat hook. And it gets right in our spine. And we're stuck on that hook. And what's the opposite of praise? Blame. You ever blame anybody? Well, I guess you know about praise blame. Then. Eyes that wish to be better than others, that show <laughs> off. They're eyes that are looking for fame. Superior. They're superior. They're better than. But look at the things that we can find to be superior about. We can take anything. I'm here to show you what not to do. We can take anything, no matter how stupid, how Neanderthal an idea, how dark and narrow and contracted and negative an idea, and turn it into some cause, some reason to feel proud about ourselves. It's really insane when you think, when you step back and look at it dispassionately as if it were someone else. It's insane. Then you see that we really are crazy. And we're crazy because there's no head. There are just thousands of eyes all running around screaming that they're the king. And whichever one gets to the phone and holds onto it and screams his order into the phone, that's the king for a second or three seconds or however long it is. So these eyes that wish to be better than others to show off, they're really amusing. You better learn to laugh at them because you're never going to overcome them. There are too many of them. If you stay here in false personality, hacking it out with a sword toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, you're going to stay here forever and you're, you've lost. You're fighting a battle of attrition and you will lose because there are more of them and they have more energy and they know how to get it. You will never win that way. You've got to separate from them. You've got to distance yourself from them. You've got to observe them from a higher position and just allow the light to weaken them and make them passive. And as you do that, you become more and more active from your higher position. This is how this work works. You can verify this for yourself. All restlessness is due to lies, to falsity. Real peace, real harmony, 
real happiness, real calm, deep, abiding, genuine, real peace and calm only comes from the truth. Have you ever struggled with something about yourself that someone said was true that you just knew was wrong? And you struggled and struggled and struggled and then one day had a moment when you realized that they were right? and that you were a piece of garbage, and you went, oh my God, that's the truth. I really am a coward, or I really am a phony, or I really am a flatterer, or I really am a liar. And then this sudden calm comes about you. It's like, oh, how about that? And it's like the centeredness. Have you noticed that? The centeredness, and it's a position of such power and strength. But just accepting, yes, that's right. Accepting the fact that we're liars. Oh, yeah, that's right. Somebody asked me something the other day, how I could meditate a couple hours a day and still be a jerk. I thought that was kind of funny because there's really no way to answer the person because the person is taking themselves as one. They think that they're one. And so when you're looking at yourself as one, you look at everybody else as one. And when you're looking at people as one, you can never solve that riddle. How can you meditate two hours a day and still be a jerk? Well, it's easy. The meditating eyes and the jerk eyes don't get together. <laughs> no big, no, it's just simple. Those eyes don't know each other. They're on different parts of the inner planet. These eyes that meditate live over here in Tibet. These other eyes live here in America where they're always jerks. Loud, obnoxious jerks, throwing money around and thinking that they're king of the world and blah, 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 blah. They have the answers to everything. So that's how. But how do you tell somebody that when they're taking themselves as one? When they're taking themselves as one, you can't tell them. They have to first see that they are not one. Then when they see that they are not one, there's no question anymore. They don't go, well, how come you're not one? Well, I don't know. How come you're not one? Because I'm not. Because you're not. Because we're not. Because it takes a lot of work to be one. And we're not there yet. That's why. Well, then what's all this about? This is all about getting there. Well, it doesn't seem to be working. No. Then maybe you should work harder. Because it's working over here. And that's really the bottom line. It's working over here, people. I have verifiable results. I can see that it's working. I can see that I'm a jerk. Can you say that about yourself? No, but I can say it about you. Well, then maybe you need to work a little harder. Well, I am working hard on you, fixing you. No, you need to work on yourself. So some people can't do this work. Too busy working on others. Most of our eyes tell lies. It's how they fight with real life and with ourselves. Most eyes in us tell lies. Why? They don't like how it is. They want it to be some other way. So their way of fighting real life, how it really is, is to lie about it and say it's some other way. Well, that's not that way. It's some other way. It's not that way. Somebody comes along and they say, you know, you're a liar. I am not. We're indignant. How dare you call me a liar? We get indignant by the very thought that someone would dare say that to us. A paragon of virtue that we are. We're always honest. We always tell the truth. Oh boy, that's a mouthful of lies, isn't it? They wish to keep something going that is not ourselves. These eyes are lying because they want to keep something going that's not us. They want to keep the gushing eyes going. There's some good in it. It's not you. It could be the new Messiah. It's not you. But it's good. But it's not you. But it could be. It's lying eyes saying it could be. It's not you. It's not you. It's something that's not you. You will never find peace, calm, happiness, harmony in what is not you. You're only going to find it in what is you. Now find what is you. And how do you find what is you in this whole mass of what is not you? Well, find what is not you first then and start to eliminate what is not you. And eventually you'll get down to what is you. Have you noticed yourself talking away, like I was doing at the drivers? Blah, 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 and all of a sudden you realize how full of righteous indignation you are, and you're airing your grievances, and then suddenly the whole thing is nothing but lies. It takes some boldness to be able to see it and go, oh, sorry, doctor, I was mistaken. As a matter of fact, that's all a bunch of balloon juice. Never mind, just cancel that, just erase all that, forget all that, and just back away from it and laugh. What else can you do? Then be amused. And so I shared with you my insanity about drivers. And I laughed at it. Why? Because that's the best thing to do. Be amused at those eyes because you're not going to overcome them. There are more of them than there are of me. Their name is Legion. There are a mess of them. Anybody know how many soldiers are in a Legion? Thousands. Have you come to the point of seeing your suffering as all lies? When you do, there's a deep sense of inner calm that comes with this. Well, yeah, there's the laughing at first like Diana had. But then there's this deep sense of inner calm. It's like, it's all lies. And you start to see that. It's so rewarding. Man, know thyself. If you want real peace, real happiness, and real harmony, you must come to know the truth about yourself. The self isn't. There is no self. You don't have a self. You have some I that you are putting your sense of self into right now. But in five minutes, that'll change. And then in five minutes, that'll change. And in two minutes, that'll change. And then three seconds, that'll change. And then nine seconds, that'll change. Then in an hour, that'll change. And then three minutes, that'll change. 
And so your sense of self goes into whatever I happens to catch you, happens to get you to identify with it at the moment. When you find the truth about you, that's the truth about you, then you begin to work. When you begin to work, then you can find something inside of you that's solid, that's calm, that's at peace. And that's the point from which you work. And it's a beautiful thing.